are either too greedy or too uh, suffer from self-importance. Uh, they feel that uh, they, they matter a lot. Uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. But All to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? They serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, the, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split, and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. The moment they serve their purpose, all the useful idiots are used, either be executed entirely, all the idealistically minded Marxists, or uh, uh, exiled or put in prisons, like in Cuba. Many, many former Marxists are in Cuba, I mean in prison. So most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without uh, a de department of of uh, information of the USSR embassy were listed for execution. Uh, and when I discovered that fact, of course I was sick. I was mentally and physically sick. I thought that I, I'm going to explode one day during the briefing at the ambassador's office. I would stand up and say something that we are basically a bunch of murderers. That's what we are. We, it has nothing to do with friendship and understanding between the nation and blah, blah, blah. We are murderers. We behave as a bunch of thugs in, in a country which, which is hospitable to us, a country which, which with ancient traditions. But I, I, I did not defect. I tried to get the message across to my horror. Nobody wanted even to listen, least of all to believe what I had to say. And I tried all kinds of tricks. I would, I would, I would uh, leak information through letters uh, or lost documents or something like that. And still I got no message. Uh, the message was not published even in the conservative mass media of, of India. The immediate impulse to defect was Bangladesh crisis, which was described by American correspondents as Islamic grassroots revolution, which is absolute baloney. Uh, there was nothing to do with Islam, and there was no grassroots revolution. Actually, there are no grassroots revolutions, period. Any revolution is a byproduct of a highly organized group uh, of conscientious and professional um, um, organizers. But has nothing to do with grassroots. In Bangladesh, it was nothing with grassroots. Most of the uh, Awami League party members, Awami League means People's Party, uh, were trained in Moscow in the high party school. Most of the Mukti Fauj leaders, Mukti Fauj in Bengali means People's Army, same as SWAPO and, and all kind of liberation armies all over the world, the same bunch of useful idiots. They were trained at Lumumba University and various centers of the KGB in Simferopol, in, in Crimea, and in Tashkent. So when I saw that India, Indian territory is being used as a, as a jumping board to destroy East Pakistan, I saw myself thousands of, of so-called students traveling through India to East Pakistan, through the territory of India, and Indian government pretended not to see what was going on. They knew perfectly well. The Indian police knew it. The intelligence department of Indian government knew it. The KGB, of course, knew it. And the CIA knew it. That, that was most infuriating because when I defected and I explained to the CIA debriefers they should watch out because East Pakistan is going to erupt any moment. They said I, 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 was, I was reading too, too many James Bond novels. Anyway, so East Pakistan was doomed. Uh, 
one of my colleagues in, in the Soviet consulate in Calcutta, when he was dead drunk, he ventured into the basement to, to relieve himself. And he found that big boxes which said printed matter to Dhaka University. Dhaka is the capital of East Pakistan. And since he was drunk and curious, he opened one of the boxes and he discovered not printed matter. He discovered Kalashnikov guns and ammunition in there. Anyway, it's a long story. When I saw the, the preparations for the, for the uh, invasion into East Pakistan, obviously I wanted to defect immediately. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't at that time uh, make up my mind when and where and how. One of the reasons, of course, you see, I was in love with India. I mentioned that before. I spoke the languages. I socialized with people. And I understood that I had to, to act fast unless I want this beautiful country to be permanently and irreparably damaged by our presence. One of the reasons not to defect was, as you can see, I was living in relative affluence. Who the hell in, in, in the normal mind would defect and do what? To be abused by your media? To be called McCarthyist and fascist and paranoid? Or to drive a taxi in New York City? What for? What the hell for should I defect? To be abused by, by Americans? To be insulted in exchange for, for my effort to bring the truthful information about impending danger of subversion? As you can see, I was living in quite a comfortable conditions next to swimming pool where Indians were not allowed, by the way. I was highly paid expert in propaganda. I had my family. I was respected by my nation. M my career was cloudless. The third reason, how to defect with the family. To defect with the baby and the wife would be virtual suicide because uh, according to law, that hypocritical law which I quoted before, the Indian police will have to hand me over back to the KGB and that will be the end of my defection and probably my life. Again. I cannot smuggle my wife because she was not quite sure what, what I was doing. She was not that idealistically involved and she was definitely not in, in, in the total picture of what I was doing for the KGB. She would be shocked if I, if I uh, you know, put her in my van and, and drive her to an American embassy or elsewhere. That would be a greatest danger. So. Again, I had to defect in such a way that my defection would look as simple disappearance. And there were many cases like that when the Soviet agents simply disappeared, either killed in action or thanks to their curiosity and, and their close contacts with radicals. Some of them were killed by the Marxists, by the way. It happened in many African countries when the Soviet KGB were killed by Africans themselves. Not because they hated Marxism and Leninism, but because they were simply trigger happy bunch of unruly characters. If you give them machine gun, they will shoot. And some of the Soviets obviously were not careful enough to protect themselves. And they got into embarrassing situations when they were shot at the crossfire between factions of, of so-called liberation movements. Anyway, so I, I decided, as I said, to study the um, counterculture. I decided this probably would be the best way to disappear. I socialized with characters like this on the left. You see, he's a barefoot American hippie. Uh, it took me quite a long time to study exactly what they were doing and how to mix with them. But eventually I did it. Most of Indian newspapers carried my picture and promise of 2,000 rupees for information about my whereabouts. But they were looking for the wrong person because they obviously tried to stop a young Soviet diplomat in white shirt and tie, and th this is how I looked at the time of defection. Nobody could possibly think that a Soviet diplomat would be as crazy as to join a bunch of hippies. That's you. Tra yes, yeah. travel India and smoke hush. So I made it literally a, a, almost like a Hollywood-style um, detective story. Uh, from under the nose of the KGB in Bombay airport, I landed a plane and I flew to, to Greece, where I was debriefed by the CIA. That's basically most, th that's all f for my okay, we can slides. Turn the, we can turn off the projector, and that's very interesting. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, 
and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result? The result you can see. Most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of the uh, of, uh, United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, Obviously, they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously, they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here, you can, you can get... Uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand and uh, it will be greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, Actually, it's overfulfilled because demoralization now reaches such areas.